first of all, I wanted to get a sense of who's in the audience. How many of you are developers? Okay. How many of you are protocol researchers or designers? Okay, couple, okay, good. So as you all know that blockchains, right, they're immutable. We cannot let bad data into a blockchain period, right? We have to be very strict about this. We have to be extremely strict about this, actually. What I'm going to be sharing today is our distributed Oracle agreement protocol, DORA. I want to say that uh, our DORA protocol was recently uh, accepted into ICDCS, the academic forum, and uh, that's really great to get some peer review. And uh, let's begin. So what are oracles? You know, blockchains don't actually communicate with the outside world. They don't communicate with each other. And you need something, which are oracles, to do this. Oracles are actually a middleware, right? While this graphic shows just a little kind of small committee of notes, actually our system is much larger and much more robust than this. So once again, if you want to get external data, whether that's price feed data, whether that's cross-chain communication, whether that's on-chain randomness, you need to use oracles to achieve this. Supra has a very unique architecture. We organize our nodes into tribes and clans. Tribes are, let's suppose, a large committee, say 400, 500 nodes. Clans are subcommittees that are randomized into these groups of nodes, uh, which constitute a clan. What we do is to make our protocol highly efficient, we do something we call commodity sharding. We basically assign different commodities to be assigned to various clans, right? So for example, clan one might be responsible for A coin to G coin. Clan two might be responsible for H coin to, you know, M coin, for example. And this actually gives us the ability to be robust, secure, and also very scalable. Now, each node in the clan itself, a clan itself might be on the order of about over 100 nodes, okay? And each node itself is going to be connected up to 20 data sources. Now, the thing is, instead of having every single node in a tribe, which is a larger network, right, listening to every single data source, that's not actually very scalable. We realize that by utilizing randomness, by randomly assigning nodes to different clans, and also randomly assigning different data sources to each node, we can have much more scalability. So the first phase of the protocol is that the nodes in a clan are going to be assigned a subset of the data sources. In fact, every single node does not have to listen to every single data source. We plug in directly to the WebSocket. So these exchanges, for example, are pushing data out every second, right? And our nodes are connected directly to it. Notice that this data source is not actually connecting to every single node in the clan. And remember, a clan itself is a subcommittee of the entire network, a randomized subcommittee. Now, moreover, each node itself is also assigned a set of the available data sources, meaning every single node does not actually have to listen to every single data source. We utilize a VRF. Supra utilizes threshold cryptography which allows us to have native randomness. And this VRF is a deterministic but unpredictable assignment. So each node is actually assigned a subset of the data sources. Remember, we're trying to be as robust as possible while being very efficient and low latency. Now, if I'm a node, for example, and I'm, I'm assigned, say, seven out of the 20 data sources, what I'm going to do is wait for the responses and then find the median value, the middle value, okay? And then I'll take that middle value and I'll submit it to the aggregators. Now we have multiple aggregators. And the reason why we do this is so we have better liveness properties. What I mean by liveness, meaning if you have a single aggregator and that node is Byzantine or offline or crashed, then this, the protocol kind of pauses. So by having multiple aggregators, you actually have um, more robustness and you have uh, better liveness. So what am I agreeing on? What are the aggregators agreeing on? The aggregators are waiting for 51% of the nodes in the clan to send the response. And what we're going to seek is what we call a coherent cluster. Okay. So we wait for 51% uh, percent of the responses and the responses have to, we have to, to, to create a coherent cluster. They have to, the values have to be between a certain distance from each other. Okay. So remember the nodes are 
listening to multiple data sources. They are finding the median value, the middle value, and they're submitting to an aggregator. The aggregator is waiting for 51% of the responses and then looks for a coherent cluster. The coherent cluster needs to be, it, it's composed of the median values, right? And they need to be between a certain distance from each other. So uh, there's different ways to do this. In, in this particular case, the value is 31 to 39. There's a distance of eight. This is beyond the protocol predicates. So this is not a valid response. So as I mentioned, the cluster size has to be 51%, F plus one. And when we have this, what we actually do is we create and calculate the mean, the average. So we, cal we, we wait for enough responses of the median value. We create a coherent cluster and we can calculate the average, the mean of this. What does this give us? It gives us a very good representative value of what is the price of this commodity right now, right? So Bitcoin in South Korea is obviously different than Coinbase's value, right? And the final value here is going to be a very good, in fact, I think the absolute best uh, representative value that you can achieve. That's not quite yet enough, right? So the aggregators, after achieving a coherent cluster, have to broadcast that to the nodes in the clan. The nodes of the clans have to agree on this information and create a threshold signature on this value. Now, I'm not going to dive into this, but of course, we have to make sure that the data is available. Otherwise, you cannot make this calculation, right? But we have a protocol that we'll be publishing called XRBC, Reliable Broadcast Primitive. Now, finally, once we have a clan reach a 51% agreement on the, 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 the presented value, we ultimately have to publish this to a blockchain. Now, in our case, Supra actually, as our backbone, is we do have a blockchain, and we use the blockchain itself uh, you know, SMR, by the way, stands for state machine replication. We use it as an ordering service to think, keep things in order, to have a global agreement on the ordering of things, right? Now, what this gives us is um, it's a very robust system. And this is actually, by having this backbone technology, we're able to, instead of having everyone do everything, which is kind of the traditional lazy, not lazy, excuse me, traditional old school designs, this model gives us the ability to use a subcommittee and of that subcommittee, use only 51%. Traditional models require 67% of the entire network to agree upon it. This is the actually insight because we get to be very fast and efficient. In fact, um, our ordering service, our blockchain, Supra BFT, which we'll be sharing publicly in the next few weeks or months, it has sub-second finality. Now, Supra's Oracle data itself can't get sub-second because we have to communicate with multiple exchanges or data sources, and then run the protocol then anchor into the blockchain. But by having a fast finality blockchain itself, right, on the order of, you know, sub-second finality, we can be both extremely robust, highly scalable, and also low latency. Now, what happens if we have a, uh, a situation in which we can't achieve a coherent cluster? Well, in this case, we do have a fallback protocol. In a worst case scenario, you know, actually, I want to say that solving the Oracle problem is very difficult because you have to solve both, you know, Byzantine default tolerance, and you have to also deal with the secondary issue of data sources themselves being Byzantine. In case we can't achieve the coherent cluster and the cryptographic agreement, we'll fall back to the traditional model of everyone does everything, and we need two thirds of them to 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 uh, come to an agreement. This fallback protocol only triggers upon certain conditions if we cannot reach an agreement in a clan. Ultimately, this means in, in this model, everyone has to uh, fall back to kind of more of a standard vanilla protocol where we need two thirds plus one to agree on it. But that's all the nodes in the network. In the happy path, you know, it's only 51% of the subcommittee, much less nodes. And by randomizing the composition of the nodes in the subcommittee, we're able to uh, basically have the attributes that we do have. Now, moreover, every cycle, say every 15, 20, 30 minutes, we will randomize the assignment of different commodities to different clans. We want to always keep things changing and rotating. Moreover, every epoch, say a day and a half or two days, we also want to shuffle the constitution of each clan. So our network topology is constantly changing, right? And we have, we have actually innovated some novel 
non-interactive distributed key generation NIDKG primitives that we'll be also be sharing soon that allows us to do this in a very efficient manner. You can the analogy I like to give, right? Since we're at SWE and SWE is kind of water, right? Imagine a body of water that is not changing or flowing. It will become a swamp. It will become infected. It will not be great. But if it's flowing constantly, if the network topology is constantly changing and you can't predict it and it's randomized, you can have a vibrant, healthy ecosystem. So I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to go through this a little bit faster. But more or less, this Tickstart door protocol allows us to simultaneously, in parallel, run the protocol often. And this also gives us the scalability qualities and liveness qualities we're looking for. Oops, let me go back one. What's nice about what we're doing here, and since Super itself does have a backbone technology that is a blockchain, we can also be doing kind of cross-commodity correlation. So for example, if we know what the price of Bitcoin to USD is, and we know the price of Bitcoin to Ether is, and we know the price of Ether to USD, we can actually cross-correlate the assets to see if there's any anomalies. We can do detection very quickly in case of uh, issues. So remember, while some protocols may allow um, faulty data to enter a blockchain and say we'll cover it with insurance, we have the attitude that we just do everything we can to never let that happen, period. And that's because composability. One smart contract that gets bad data that's composing with another smart contract, you can have cascading failures. So our attitude in point of view is you have to be extremely strict about this, but also you want to have performance. You want to have low latency systems and results. Uh, also, once again, kind of back to what I was saying, since Super itself has a backbone technology that is a blockchain, we can keep track of like the last thousand blocks, for example, and see if there any value that's generated is beyond a standard deviation of, of acceptable values. And this can trigger the fallback protocol. So once again, we don't know sometimes if it's the data source that's the problem or is it the node network that are Byzantine. So we perform a historical his consistency check on this information. And uh, this is how we know whether or not it's kind of just additional sensory organs, so to speak. So we know what's going on and we can kind of imagine uh, this is a, a way to detect anomalies. So in summary, Super is highly decentralized and randomized, which is kind of our security paradigm. We're highly efficient through this commodity sharding through the tribe and clan architecture. And we're also very, very resilient. So that's the uh, that's our core protocol. Once again, we were published in ICDCS recently. We just got the news like three days ago. And uh, yeah, you can go to superoracles.com slash white papers to read more about this. We have a video. We have um, our light paper as well. And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, we're going to mainnet um, actually today in soft launch. So we're not really telling the world. Mainnet alpha, let's call it. So it's very, very, it's centralized for now. But at least we're entering the arena, so to speak. So um, yeah, come come visit us, talk to us if you want to learn more. Super is very bullish on SWE as well. I mean, the DAG technology is a breakthrough. You know, anyone that's into, um, you know, uh, distributed compute or consensus algorithm designs knows that this is pretty remarkable, as well as the move language, of course. So very bullish on the space. We're very happy to be of service to your ecosystem. And we got one minute to ask any questions. Well, that's a good sign. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Alex. Oh, sorry. John Crook.